The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ladies and gentlemen, the title of my presentation is Classification of Microhabitats, a Powerful Tool for Comparative Studies, Sustainable Development, and Environmental Impact Analysis in Wetlands. Let's start first with the ecological background. As you can see at the map, South America is covered with a large number of wetlands of large extensions and different types. You have river floodplains, you have uh, interfluvial wetlands, you have uh, periodically flooded savannas, you have uh, in the mountain region saline swamps, and so on. What we can state for, in general terms, for the large Brazilian wetlands, all large Brazilian lowland wetlands belong to the group of floodplains subjected to a monomodal predictable flood pulse of high, respectively low amplitude. Structures, functions and processes in periodically flooded wetlands are described by the flood pulse concept of Jung et al. 1989, which is also the basis for this presentation. The findings hold true for other tropical wetlands and subtropical wetlands with a similar hydrological regime. Why do we have the monomodal flood poles? If you look to the distribution of the precipitation in Brazil, you can see that the rainfall is not equally distributed, but we have in most places, we have an explicit wet and dry period. This results in the large rivers in Flood, monomodal flood pulses with a high or a low amplitude. The Amazon River near Manaus has an amplitude, a mean amplitude of about 10 meters, whereas the Paraguay River has a mean amplitude only about three or four meters. When we discuss the genesis of wetlands, we can see a profound difference between large wetlands in northern temperate regions and in the tropics and subtropics. In northern temperate regions, floodplains occur in valleys along large rivers, and they show a relatively low accumulation of organic material. A second type is oligotrophic peat box and eutrophic swamps in depressions. They have a rather stable water level, lacustre character, and are fed by mostly by rainwater and show an explicit accumulation of organic material. All of them are post-glacial, that means they are, in geological terms, very young. Large lowland wetlands in South America are different, and this holds true also for other moist tropical and subtropical regions worldwide. First, we have recent active floodplains along large rivers. They have a fluvial character, low content of organic material in the sediments. We can divide this group in two subgroups. One created by the sea level rise after the last glacial period. Those are the lower river courses, for instance, of the Amazon River. And then the others created by actual hydrological processes. Those are the large inland river floodplains. In addition, we have periodically drying active paleo floodplains. They are also of fluvial origin and occur in valleys along large rivers. They are of old age and actually inundated by excess of rainfall. The, con the content of organic material in the sediments is low. They are in hydrological contact with the parent river and is active recent floodplain. And third, we have periodically flooded flat areas because of insufficient drainage in interfluvial regions. They also are characterized by low content of organic material and in the sediments. For the definition of this wetlands, we use the Brazilian definition of the extent of wetland. This definition shows two new approaches. One is it determines 
the extent and it uses the area flooded during the mean maximum flood. This is very important and this is a point of controversy actually in the discussion in Brazil and other tropical countries because, for instance, uh, agribusiness wants to reduce the wetland area to low level areas. If this would go through, about in Brazil, about 80% of the area of the large wetlands would lose uh, legal protection because about 80% of the floodplains fall dry during low water period. Another point is that the definition of a wetland area should include, if present, internal permanently dry areas as these habitats are of fundamental importance to the maintenance of the functional integrity and biodiversity of the respective wetland. I will come to this point later. I will explain uh, uh, this aspect on the example of the Pantanal of Mato Grosso. You can see here is the area. It is a floodplain of about 160,000 square kilometers, of which 140,000 square kilometers are in Brazil. The remaining 20,000 are in Bolivia and Paraguay. On the right side, by the colors, you see the depths and lengths of the inundation. On the right side, in the east, you have low floods for shorter periods, and on the west, you have uh, deep floods for longer periods. Here you can see the complex structure of the Pantanal. The Pantanal is composed by uh, alluvial fans of the large rivers, which have deposited the, their sediments at least during the last million years. So during a long period, most of the area is paleo floodplain. That means the paleo floodplain is not anymore in direct contact with the river water. It mostly flooded by rainwater, but it is in contact with the recent floodplain by the rivers. And the recent floodplain indicated here in greenish colors covers about only 20% of the entire area. Here you see a close view of the mega fan of the Takuari River, which covers an area of about 50,000 square kilometers. The river has deposited the, the sediments during many hundreds of thousands of years, and the different areas can be differentiated by the age. The most recent one is the part with the number one, where the river still actually uh, put recent sediments in. The oldest one is number six, which is very old, and good part of this very old uh, parts of the fan are only uh, are mostly dry because they have deposit have been deposited during periods of a moist, more moist climate about 500 to 1 million years ago when the floodplain was inundated by more water and the sediments could be collocated at higher levels. In these areas we have a lot of small lakes, remaining lakes and depressions which rep represent the character of the wetland also in the permanently dry areas. The sediments of the paleo floodplain are strongly weathered. Here I show only the content of calcium. The content of calcium in the rivers Cuyaba, uh, Aricameri, and Cassange are relatively high, and in the land surfaces along the Transpantanera, they are much lower. That means the weathering of the paleo sediments has reduced a lot of calcium, but also of other elements. The fertility of these paleo sediments is considerably lower than the uh, fertility of the recent sediments because of the lixiviation of many of important bio elements. If we summarize, we can say in contrast to temperate regions, 
region. Large river floodplains, many tropical and subtropical floodplains are composed by parts of different age. The sediments of older parts are heavily weathered and impoverished in nutrients. They are covered by different vegetation units, and this increases macro habitat diversity. Let's come to the macro habitat classification. Why a macro habitat classification is necessary? In large and complex wetlands, the definition of smaller landscape units is necessary for comparative scientific studies between different wetlands and their macro habitats to develop an application of specific management methods for environmental impact analysis and specific environmental legislation. For instance, Biodiversity is not randomly distributed in large wetlands, but is related to specific macro habitats. Here are some uh, pictures of large wetlands. Up you have part of the Pantanal in the wet part. On the right side you have the Bananal wetland area, where you obviously can see different vegetation units below also the, the Pantanal and on the right part below part of the Amazon River floodplains. Here as well you can see different morphological and vegetational units which show the difficulties to characterize this area. But this is not enough yet. When you look to the area here in the Pantanara, then you have the view during low water under heavy droughts. All is dry. In part, the area is burned. There are very few places for, with water. You would not consider this as a wetland. After the first rains, the situa situation is different. Terrestrial grasses start to sprout. The area is green. The trees are flowering. The area looks like a, pond, a, a, a parkland savanna. And a little bit later, at high water, the total area is under water. You can see here the area is covered with a meter of water. And in the back, you have a forest which is in part flooded. In part, these flooded forest islands are also a little bit higher and are permanent terrestrial habitats which serve as refuge for cattle and wild animals for instance, at night time, where they can rest without staying permanently in the water. So how can we subdivide the large flood poisoning wetlands in macro habitat uh, uh, to determine this, to define the macro habitats? The large wetlands occupy in the Brazilian classification uh, the level of a class. Then we introduced the term functional unit. A functional unit is a large landscape unit in a wetland subjected to specific hydrological conditions during the annual cycle. We differentiate between five functional units, permanent aquatic, predominantly aquatic, permanent terrestrial, predominantly terrestrial and permanent swampy. A six functional unit includes all anthropogenic macro habitats independent of the hydrological conditions. Then we have the subclass. The subclass is a subunit of a functional unit with specific hydrologic conditions and with a characteristic cover of higher vegetation. Here, for the first time in the entire classification, biology, that means vegetation enters. In this case, uh, in general terms, that means savanna vegetation or forests or, uh, uh, let's say, grasslands and so on. And then we have the macro habitat. And the macro habitat is a subunit of subclasses characterized by indicator plant species or groups of species. That means here we specify which species occupy and characterize the macro habitat. Here in the picture you see the difference on the left permanent terrestrial, that means the groundwater never never reaches permanently the rhizosphere. Then swampy, the groundwater level goes to the surface and a, a little bit above the surface. 
then the functional unit predominantly terrestrial suffers a short shallow flood pulse most of the year the area is dry then the predominantly aquatic means a pulse is deeper and longer means the area is mostly covered by water only for a few months dry and then permanently aquatic those are the lakes and river channels inside the flood plain, which are permanently aquatic. Now let's translate the theory into a practical example. I used here uh, the Rio Negro floodplain because it is not so complex and not so diverse as the Pantanal is. In the upper figure, you have a cross section through a uh, the shore of an island in the, in the Negro River. At high water level, the total island is covered by water. In the upper part, we have a forest, which is called High Igapo Forest, a specific, specific forest, which does not, the trees do not tolerate a very long and deep flooding. A little bit deeper, we have the Low Igapo Forest, that means the trees uh, tolerate at least six to eight months of flooding. On the lower end, we have pioneer shop communities and the lowest part annual herbaceous plants. On the river, we have a steep shore. And this is a very important macro habitat as well. Why this is a macro habitat? There are no plants. Well, this is, for instance, the nesting part for many, per many birds which build their nets in this the nest in the steep shores and when the water is coming up freshwater crabs are uh, building their nests and some fishes build their nests in the steep shores the next cross-section is uh, a lower island it is deeply flooded at high water a point bar let's say at high water is deeply flooded uh, so we have only low igapo forest pioneer shot communities, but we have a sandy beach without vegetation. Again, the question, why a sandy beach? Sandy beaches are important nesting places, for instance, for river turtles and for many shorebirds, which build during low water their nests here in this area. So these are very important uh, uh, macro habitats for a couple of different uh, animals. And the third example, where the uh, floodplain directly hits the upland. We have in the lowest part very old Eschweiler stands. This is a very flood resistant tree, then a little bit higher younger Eschweiler stands and then low Igapo forest. Look at this example. We will come to this example back a little bit later. So when we transfer this information in our classification system, I will just give a short part of uh, this classification of the Negro River. We start here with functional unit. This is a periodically aquatic area. The subclass is water distribution and drainage system inside the area RTTZ is aquatic terrestrial transition zone. At the macro habitat, we have only one macro habitat, are the short connections between the rivers and floodplain lakes. Then we have a second subclass, systems periodically covered by standing water, two macro habitats, free water areas, and second areas covered by free floating and rooted aquatic macrophytes. Then we have the third functional unit, periodically terrestrial areas. This is a terrestrial phase of the uh, aquatic terrestrial transition zone. Subclass uh, areas without or with sparse vegetation, the sandbars, steep shores, and rocky outcrops. Then, uh, subclass areas covered with herbaceous plants, two microhabitats, low lying areas mostly covered by perennials such as grasses and herbs, and high lying, mostly disturbed areas covered also by such as grasses and herbs. And then the third subclass areas covered by, predominantly by shrubs and trees. And then we have a couple of uh, macro habitats. I start only with one here, 
low-lying pioneer shrub communities on sandy substrate, inundated for up to 10 months, and so on, and so on. That means we have here a very clear uh, structured classification of macrophytes, which follows uh, uh, determined, uh, determined characterization of, uh, uh, let's say, of, of parameters, which can be applied in any of the different floodplain areas. We did that until now for five different large floodplains. You can see the numbers here, the Pantanal is by far the most diverse with respect to macrohabitats, 16 subclasses and 66 macrohabitats. Macro the others, Igapos of the Rio Negro has only 12 uh, subclasses and 25 macrohabitats. All these macrohabitats are characterized by the same parameters and now we can compare the different macrohabitats between the different floodplains and we can as well compare the flood, floodplains with each other, for instance, showing that the Pantanal is the most complex one. Why? Because it is at the edge of forest and savanna, so it has all the macrohabitats of the forested floodplains in the Vasias and Igapos, but also all the savanna habitats, which Amazonia forested floodplains don't have. Furthermore, as you have seen, the uh, geology is very complex in the Pantanal, so we have uh, different types of paleo floodplains which create soils and specific conditions for different uh, plant communities. Coming to the environmental impact analysis, just one example, you see here the Amazon River, and I call your attention to the period in the beginning of the 1970s. I made my doctoral thesis in the end of the 60s, and in the beginning of the 70s, I came back exactly during that period. And I was impressed because uh, there was a lot of dieback of trees and shrubs at the lowest flood level. It was impressive that mainly, or uh, uh, also, the very old trees uh, were at the lowest level were dying. Here you can see the Eschweiler. At that time, I already postulated that this would have happened because of the very long wet period. But at that time, nobody cared and nobody discussed the problems of global climate change. I postulated the impact of the flooding on the trees and shrubs, but I couldn't prove it. Only later, my colleague, uh, Dr. Schögert, built a, a diameter growth curve here and could prove that these trees on the, on the right are the oldest trees in the Amazon basin. They can become more than 1,000 years old, and they are very small or relatively small trees uh, well, growing to more than one meter in, in, in diameter, but are relatively small and are growing on the lowest flood level. So that means if these uh, trees are more than 1,000 years old, that means that during the last 1,000 years, we never had a period of so long, so deep flooding. If you look here to the next Yes, this is also a stand of Eschweiler uh, tenuifolia, and this is in a tributary in, in, in the uh, river below the Balbina hydropower reservoir. What happened when the river, reservoir was closed? The energy company delivers water also at low water period. That means the mean value. Uh, the, the mean flood uh, below the river increased by about 80 centimeters. And this resulted to so much stress that all the trees died. You can see it here on the next as well. Even a short dry period does not help. The trees are dead. Uh, 
was a colleague, my colleague, uh, uh, Jochen Schöngart, um, cut uh, pieces of the trees and could determine that the die, die back of the trees started about uh, six years after closing the reservoir. That means after six years, the trees could not stand this heavy uh, floodsters anymore and died. Uh, whereas in a tributary, which did not, have not been affected by this higher water levels, the Eschweiler stands continued alive without any uh, negative impact. That's coming quickly to management. Important environmental factors for sustainable management of floodplains are first, we have heavy seasonal flood and drought stress in savannas in combination with fire stress. In all paleo floodplains, very nutrient poor soils. Many recent floodplains are also nutrient poor exceptions are the nutrient rich recent whitewater floodplains, the vases of Andean origin. Then we have a large macro habitat diversity, which correspond, corresponds to large functional and species diversity and complex interhabitat interactions. In Amazonian floodplains, we have high numbers of endemic species, and uh, some macro habitats are very sensitive against long lasting changes in hydrology, and they are good indicators for human impact and global climate change. So, Management priorities, very simple, maintenance of macro habitat diversity, which correspond, corresponds to maintenance of vital structures, functions, and biodiversity. A very simple thing. Recommendable management methods are controlled fishery, ecotourism in periodically inundated savannas, extensive cattle ranching, in forested floodplain selective timber extraction, in nutrient-rich floodplains, like the Amazonian Vasias on higher lying areas, small scale agriculture, cattle ranching, and forest culture, forests on low lying areas should be protected. And many nutrient poor floodplains are very fragile and have such a low production potential that they should be completely protected for the maintenance of biodiversity and the puffer function in the hydrological cycle. Destructive management methods are high density cattle ranching because this reduces macro habitat diversity by large scale destruction of natural vegetation cover, plantation of exotic grasses, drainage of swampy areas and destruction of turbid mounds to uh, make the area flat for uh, uh, exotic grasses. Then the construction of boulders to control floods and irrigation of plantations, uh, for instance, the periodically flooded savannas of the Araguaya River then indirect, because this modifies completely a flood causing wetland into a dry land uh, agricultural area. And then indirect negative management impacts, the canalization of rivers, actually, for instance, the canalization of the Paraguay River in the Pantanal, which is called the Hydro, -Hydro Via project, construction of large hydroelectric power plants, and increasing sediment input from the catchment area. The worldwide problem is the global climate change. Here, an example, destruction of native vegetation in the Araguaya River floodplain. And then the area is burned. If you fly over the Araguaya River floodplain, you see a lot of areas where fire is affecting the uh, floodplain at low water period. The effect is that the fire not only hits the area where the vegetation is destroyed, it runs into forested parts, affects the trees, the trees are dying, and when the next fire comes, it finds a lot of uh, fuel to burn, and then the fire is going further and further into the forested area and destroys the forest. It's a very dangerous uh, uh, development because this macro habitats, this forested macro habitats, needs hundreds of years to be uh, re established. And here's the example of a polder on the Araguaya River. You can see around you have still uh, the normal floodplain area, and the back is the Araguaya River. And here's the area is 
uh, closed by dikes and at uh, low water period the people is pumping water from the river into the boulder and during the rainy season so they are draining the water into the river of course this area is completely uh, modified into a uh, terrestrial uh, uh, normal structure uh, agricultural area that's coming to the conclusions large flood flood pools in wetlands have to be studied and managed at the level of macrohabitats. High macrohabitat diversity represents high functional and species diversity and complex interhabitat interactions. Management methods have to maintain as much as possible macrohabitat diversity to maintain species diversity and wetland integrity. Human impact affects macrohabitats in different ways. Some macrohabitats are more fragile than others. This has to be considered in management practices and environmental legislation. And many macrohabitats are sensitive against long-term changes in hydrology and therefore good indicators to invent environmental changes, including those of global climate. Thank you very much.